and we're live. Good morning, everybody. It's been a few days. I think it's been, what, three, four days since I've been on here. I told you there was a topic I was going to cover, and today I'm going to do it. Now, this time in the morning for me is very special because I get to think about my concepts because my brain likes to think in the morning and in night, at night. So what I do with these little lives is I kind of let you in on what I'm working through in my mind. Really, that's what's going on. <clears throat> but I try to present it in a way where there's something to learn. So, how's everybody doing? It's a beautiful summer morning. The topic today is going to be uh, the power of associations. This is a dog training channel, as you guys know. And I like to think of things a certain way when I'm going to work with the dogs. I like to make sure I know what I'm doing for the day. So we got a bunch of reactive dogs in. We got a bunch of dogs that are, you take them out for a walk and their heads are exploding the whole time, right? They see a dog, they lunge, they bark, they explode. They see a squirrel, they lunge, they bark, they explode. They see a car, they lunge. So these guys are just, this is what they do. This is what they do on the walk. Root, um, if you're watching our page, we got some dogs here right now. Nala, Root, Thunder, Sparkle. Um, who else is down there? Am I missing somebody? Yes, Roxy. All these dogs in right now are reactive dogs, okay? So they're not having good walks. And today, what I am focusing on is associations, okay? If you guys are familiar with the old TV show, The Dog Whisperer, this is where I got these concepts started in my brain. And then over the years, I just continued to evolve them and, and learn more. But basically, you got your dog and they have their associations of how they're supposed to respond to these triggers in the environment. Like another dog from walking down the street and they see that other dog, they start exploding. Listen, the first time it ever happens, it's usually a startle response where a dog sees another dog and they start, Oh, Russ, it's good to see you. Good morning, my friend. I'm going to try to keep this format a little informal so we can talk a little too. So the dog, let's say it's a puppy. There's no associations. There's, it's nothing. Everything's new. All right? This is where it starts. Just so you understand how this works. The dog doesn't know how to respond to the world yet. But if the dog starts learning from other dogs or has a natural response that causes them to, let's say, we're going to focus on reactivity on the walk, but you can, you can transfer this to anything, the knock on the door, the way the dog responds. They don't know how to at first. Their first time in this situation, they have no idea what to do. Um, actually, we'll use the knock on the door because that's the easiest to visualize. So it's the first time this dog hears a knock on the door and maybe it startles. Maybe it startles and barks, okay? That's a natural response. The second time, maybe it startles and barks. 10 times down the road, it's just, this is what we do when somebody knocks on the door, we, we bark. And the dog doesn't even know why anymore. You know what I'm saying? That's an association. They just do because that's what we've always done. Another way a dog learns this is there's a knock on the door and then there's another dog who's always barked at the door who starts barking at the door and that dog looks and says, oh, this is what we do, we bark at the door. One way or another, the dog has learned this response. They've done this response many, many times to the point where they do not think about it. It is autopilot. They are just simply reacting and that is their association to the situation, okay? And to the trigger. Now, this is where it gets crazy. If your dog's response is defensive, barking and, and charging and lunging and all this stuff, which is the most natural response. It is the most natural response, right? For a dog to become defensive and cautious and all this stuff, which leads to barking. Then if you don't interrupt that and tell them to not do that and to do this instead, they form associations to everything with the same response. Knock on the door, dog walking down the street, person walking by the house, squirrel, cat, car, everything's a bark, everything's this reaction. That's the association. That, my friends, if you see a dog doing this, and it's a pet dog, that, my friends, is a dog who was bought, put in a house, gave food, maybe some affection, it formed its own belief systems, and that's how the dog became. The humans never got involved in teaching the dog how to respond. So, <clears throat> so in my job, 
dogs that come to us are usually already many years of this association. Man, I'm seeing some familiar faces in here. Good morning. We're explaining how associations are, cr are created because today's all about that because as a dog trainer, you've got to understand our job is to change the way the dog views the world, right? If we really want to have an impact, we really want to change the way the dog interacts even with the world, even when I'm not around, I have to start changing the way they look at the world. So we got these associations and, and they all have the same response, right? The dog's reactive, barking, blah, 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 blah. And what this does is this causes stress in people's lives. So the people are like, man, this dog's not enjoyable because all it's doing is making loud noises early in the morning or at any time of the day, moving around a lot and just causing chaos. So what we do is we do state of mind training. I wanna tie this conversation of associations and state of mind training together, okay? If you're new to this, you don't know what state of mind training is, it is simply teaching the dog to be calm and, um, and take direction. There's a, there's a state of mind that we create where the dog is at its most reliable for us. And this is when it's super, super calm and super, super focused on listening to us. What's up, Mike? Man, I am seeing some cool people. I just want to stop talking about dog training and catch up with you guys. Let me get this out first and then I will. Um, where was I on that? I can't remember where I left off because I'm seeing my friends. But so yes, state of mind and associations. I want to tie them together. We teach them this calm state of mind. The calm state of mind. That's what we call it around here, right? That's what Susan Milan called it. And it's a thing. You teach a dog this state of mind, right? And then, now that you can create this state of mind, right? Because if the dog goes crazy, you can say, shh, or whatever you do, whatever sound you make that says, remember that state of mind? Go to that state of mind right now. And they will. Now the job is bringing them around these triggers, these things that they have bad associations with, letting them have that response where they say, knock on the door, rough, 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 and then saying, hey, 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 no, this state of mind. I'm not addressing the bark, okay? This is where it gets, this is where the magic happens. I'm, I'm not saying no to the bark. I'm not saying no to the charge of the door. I'm not saying no, technically I am, right? But I don't have to. I can simply just say, hey, you, you're not calm. And if I correct the dog, and it gets a little more complicated than that because people don't know what a calm dog looks like. They think their dog's calm and it's not. And you know, so you gotta know by being around one of these dogs who, under, who truly is a balanced dog to understand what it looks like. When the dog leaves this balanced state of mind and starts to become very reactive in their environment, we say that state of mind is off limits. Because all the behaviors that come along with that state of mind, that, those are side effects of the root problem. The root problem is the dog's association. They go into a defense drive, right? They, 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 get, they get bark, they get territorial, so they bark, they lunge, they do all the things that nobody likes. So for us, we look at it as a state of mind error. That's why we teach the dogs, first thing they learn is the calm state of mind, and we tell them the rule about this calm state of mind is you stay in this state of mind unless I've offered you to, 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 uh, to go and get excited and play and have fun and all this stuff but I never want you to be reactive in the environment. I will be reactive in the environment. You stay passive unless I've invited you over. This type of training now eliminates all the other problems. I never have to address jumping, uh, barking at the door or anything. I mean, we will, we'll, but it's much easier to eliminate once you teach the rules of this state of mind training. So now we start changing the dog's association through the training, because it's a two to three week program, right? So now it's, we're knocks on the door, equal calm state of mind, right? Dogs walking down the street, equal calm state of mind. All that, so the dog views things differently. So by the time they leave here, <clears throat> if they do slip up, there's the e collar corrections, which bring them to the calm state of mind. So the associations continue as they leave here. And so that, has long lasting impacts on a dog because he doesn't look at the squirrel the same way running down the street. He doesn't look at the dog the same way walking down the street that he used to. He looks at them as 
traps. Like, if I react to that, there's a consequence. So, you know, that he looks at it like that rather than, that looks like a good time. Let me go over. In fact, they're not even doing that. Like we said before, they're just responding. They're not, they're not really thinking. They're just reacting. They're on autopilot. And we tell our dogs, no autopilot. Listen to me while we're out in the world. Okay? So that's the... That's the little thing that my mind's on today because we're about to go out with a bunch of dogs um, with this week. The remainder of this week is going to be full of taking these reactive dogs and bringing them out around dogs on hiking trails, down in, in town, at stores. And if they slip up, they get corrected and they get brought back to the calm state of mind, which over time, which doesn't take as long as you think, the dog has a new association. They, they know how to behave now and you can hold them accountable. And I think usually about, if you do this for a month or two, the dog changes. Unless the dog has severe, some severe stuff going on genetically, it goes away. It just, it just freaking goes away. And even those dogs that have it genetically, like Tyson's owners watch and Phyllis, it's managed and it's managed pretty damn easily. I mean, you have to pay attention. That's, your job but it's managed it's manageable not even it's not too terrible either so that's what we're doing today thought i would come in and check in with you guys um we've got a f few really cool people here there's actually one more thing that i want to uh, talk about before i get off from here and that is and i mentioned it in the last video you have to you, you guys a lot of you guys are trainers you know those you know that situation you get yourself into sometimes, which I used to get myself into, where you have a very reactive dog, and uh, let's say it's, uh, you know, usually they're shepherds or, or pities or something of the sort, and uh, they really want to go after these dogs on the, on the walks. They highly, everything in, it's like life or death, they want to go after this dog. You know when you start to teach that dog heal and everything feels really good and then you go out into the world and you're constantly nagging this dog and correcting this dog because he's constantly still thinking about the other dog, which results in whines. He won't leave the heel position because no, 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 the correction sucks, but I still really want to go over to that dog. And then you got that dog who's in heel, but his mind is not reliable. He's still thinking dirty thoughts, naughty thoughts. How do you, how now do you get rid of that? Well, my friends, because you taught the heel command and you taught the corrections of leaving the heel command, you're probably not going to be able to clean that up very well. This dog is forever going to be stuck right there in heel, but worried about the other dog. And I can tell you where I went wrong when I used to do this and where everybody else is going. wrong. The dog simply has to learn that the fucking stove is hot. You understand what I'm saying? The dog needs opportunities before it learns heal. Experiences, let's say, certain experiences that you give the dog, controlled experiences, where they decide that that behavior is not fun anymore. And in fact, I don't like that behavior, the dog's point of view. Once the dog gets to that point, because you allow them to react to as many dogs as it takes, and you simply, you simply allow them to react safely, and you correct them heavily, and you continue to provide this opportunity until the dog consistently tells you, I have no interest in doing that anymore. They literally will walk away from a dog when they see it. They, they don't know heal or anything, but they, they don't want to react to this dog anymore. They don't want to go into that, so they try to avoid the situation. And then you say, perfect, now I'm going to teach you heal. Right? Because if you didn't do that first, the dog's always going to want to forever wonder what it's like to go up on that dog. Because you never let them go and get the experience to realize it ain't worth it. Right? Not in the way you need to. You think you did, but you didn't. Right? Because I thought I was doing it the right way, but I wasn't. Okay? So then when you learn the right way, it solves that problem. But if you do not catch it early and you start teaching heel and the dog won't break heel, so you won't get an authentic experience where the dog chooses to go over there and they'll be trapped in anxiety so you literally you trapped yourself you trained yourself in sorry i lost connection for a second we're good you literally trained yourself into uh <laughs> how can i say this your training 
is, is hindering you from making success now because the dog won't go over there to get the correction, but it wants to. And what does that lead to? Whining and all sorts of shit. Let's read. Out with Rody and Birdie in the yard right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. You know what? That's funny that I didn't think it would translate through video that the dogs would recognize me, but I've heard that by lots of people now. I've made this mistake so many times, uh, Russ, and it wasn't until, and the knowledge, I had the knowledge. Like, I knew, if, if I had to break it down, I knew how to do this. But there's a different thing of reading it and then actually doing it and actually knowing, you know, you have to let the dog go after the dog. And what I've found out, guys, you don't have to let the dog bite the dog, right? This is all controlled, by the way. If you're watching this and you're wondering, he's letting dog, it's 100% set up. The dog thinks it's his choice, but it's mine, okay? And it's safe. And we never let the dog obviously attack the dog. But they do go into, and this is where I correct, there's a time to it, all right? Because you know how people say, with these serious dogs, like the pitties that are super, super, super game, if you correct them on the e-collar while they're in a, you know, at the wrong timing, it'll cause them to fight, and that is true. And I, know, and I know the timing that causes that, and I know the proper timing that will avoid that, and I'm gonna teach you right now what I've learned. If you're taking a dog who's very game, and they lunge at another dog, and they start to open their mouth to bite, it doesn't matter. Anything about the bite, if the bite has started or if it's after the first strike, if you hit the collar after that, that dog's going to continue to fight because he's going to assume in his blind rage that that was a bite from the other dog because he struck. So what you're trying to catch it is as soon as they commit to the sequence of um, the lunge, they've committed to bringing their body to that dog's body and then they're going to bite them. That moment where they commit and they go into the sequence of charging and, it, and you see it in the eyes. They haven't quite opened their mouth for the bite yet because we do it at a distance. They're in the lunge and it's serious. Boom, that's where the correction takes place. And, um, and then we reset. And reset simply means we let the dog calm down. Hey, how's it going, buddy? What happened over there? Clear the environment, set, clear the stage for the next, uh, for the next act and then we set it up again. Here comes another dog. Perhaps the same dog, perhaps a different dog. Because we have access to that. And we do this over and over again. And this is no training. This is no... I mean, he might have some e-collar experience. It depends. Now, this is where we're getting into some interesting stuff. When do I do it? Does, do I do it before the dog has education on the collar? Or do I do it after the dog has education on the collar? And I'll tell you that it does make a difference in some cases. Because if the dog has zero education on the collar, he's going to assume that he just got his ass kicked by that dog. And sometimes you might want that. Certain dogs need a slice of humble pie. You might want them to think that they, that, that that dog did that. Or you might not. Or you might want them to think that they, they were just breaking a rule. That depends on what dog you're working with and what you're doing. You have to understand there's no rules. There's only simply different outcomes. So I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm telling you that they give you different things. And that's what I encourage people to do is to think like that. Well, what's the right way and what's the wrong way? Well, that depends on what we're looking for. You have to understand by doing both, <laughs> unfortunately. So I know that once I get a dog to understand that this behavior is something that, it went from a behavior that was really fun to a behavior that's like, I don't like that behavior anymore. They don't like doing it anymore. The only part that you gotta worry about is prey drive. And if your dog is one of these dogs, see, I let them load. See, this is a very good dog training. First sign of loading or allow them to start to react. Let's dig in. So, if I wanna teach the dog, this is where people are not going full circle because they're correcting at the first sign of loading at, from the beginning. And that means they're, 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 the dog never gets the full experience of finding out what happens when he does touch the stove. You're correcting when the dog's thinking about touching the stove. You understand? So if the dog really wants to touch the stove, he's always gonna fucking wanna touch the stove. He just won't do it, but he'll be thinking about it and your dog's gonna whine and think and be unreliable and break his sid and all this stuff. All this stuff is because they, they wonder what it's like to go over there. So, your answer. The first time is a controlled experience where we let them make the mistake fully. This goes not just for reactivity, this goes for everything. Food aggression, toy aggression, any type of big time no-no behaviors 
you got to learn to set this stuff up, set, set it up safely. Let the dog make the choice. Let the dog do the thing fully. Get the full on correction. No, this is full on correction. Bam, double, hundred, boom, inhibition. The dog doesn't want to do it anymore. They settle down. They look at that behavior. You watch the dog over and over again. Avoid the situation. Now we leave that. We teach heel. We come back and we start correcting the first sign of loading. And it's a different it's a different level of reliability. It's a, the mind is better. And that little detail right there, I'm, I can't tell you how many places aren't doing it right. Because I wasn't doing it right. And I was connecting with everybody else and they weren't doing it right either. And now we're doing it right. Um, and so, yes, you have to think like that. Because it's very frustrating when you put in that work and the dog's still whining about that dog over there. <laughs> and we get this a lot with dogs who've been through, um, well, you know, correcting at the first sign of loading is proper going home. And it is proper after the dog has had the taste of the full on consequence because what happens is the dog has the memory of that. And it goes into the comp state of mind and it lets it go much quicker, much quicker, much easier because it's been there, done that. Oh yeah. They have a memory to tie it to now. So but that's a very dangerous thing to do. You have to be skilled at setting up these situations in a safe manner and still delivering the consequence at full swing safely for everybody, dogs, all the dogs involved and all the people involved. And you can get really good at that. And you can get really good at making it feel organic so the dog doesn't know it's a training session. That's very, that's the benefit of doing it out of your house. You know, uh, the first day or two, like we have opportunities because they don't see us necessarily as a facility like the vet or something now the prey drive owners <laughs> they are going to be correct in the first sign of loading always and the dog will always every now and then start loading because certain dogs have every dog has prey drive but certain dogs can see other dogs the same way they see a squirrel they can have prey drive towards other squirrels or i'm just towards other dogs which is a problem I do use Riggins for this, and you know who's even better for this is Izzy. Because Izzy is one of those dogs, she's a bait dog. She's the perfect bait dog because Izzy will never get spooked from a dog going after her. She is has the, one of those personalities where she just is not shook at all. I mean, it's rare to find a dog like this. So a dog can explode at her and she's just happy. She doesn't even, she might move out of the way and just continue on. So I have a dog who is able to, I'm able to have dogs react to her and she's happy to do it. She's just happy to be part of it. So if you have a dog like that as a dog trainer, you're in a good spot because that dog's not going to be affected by it. Some dogs do get affected by it, like Riggins does, right? And I need to make sure, you know, I don't use him too much or, or things like this. You need an Izzy because she really does not give a shit at all. She's happy, 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 happy. I mean, she's one of these dogs. She could just, anything happened to her, she's still happy. So we use Izzy. Yes, and we use the boarding trains that are here and we use the borders that are here um, at a distance because you get that reaction. It's completely safe, but, you, but because it's a different dog, you get the conversation because the reaction comes up, right? So... Man, just so much good stuff to think about. And listen, this isn't easy. And, and I'm not saying it's perfect either. You do everything I say and you still might have this dog that's still whining. But I'm going to tell you that 90% of them won't anymore. If you're having that problem consistently, do what I said and it will go away for the most part. There are going to be these dogs. Listen, I had a, I'm having dogs that have been through multiple programs by the time they get to me. You probably will too. And what happens is they won't go after that dog because somebody already corrected them but but they didn't do it full force and they didn't bring it full circle as far as the dog's understanding so they won't go after the dog but they'll whine even while they're here and it, that's because somebody else had already tried and failed multiple people have so now i have to work harder <laughs> to try to get this dog to make the mistake and it won't sometimes but it wants to and that's not good that's annoying that leads to a dog. The reason why that's a problem, if you're watching this and you're not a dog training trainer, the reason why that's a problem is because the dog wanting to but not leads to a dog next to you while you're trying to have a conversation that's fidgety, whining, and unreliable. 
So they simply see something in the environment that they still want to go do, but they know that you don't want them to. And they respect the consequence enough to not, but they still want to, badly. Mm, so you trapped anxiety in your command, right? <laughs> so watch out for that. All right. I think I have to get breakfast. Remember me and breakfast? I, I always forget about it. So I appreciate getting on here with you guys. So many people stayed and we talked about some pretty in-depth stuff. And just remember that try to, try to think of things less of right and wrong ways and just think of them as ways that give you different things, give you different outcomes. So they, it's just another tool, right? Okay. I think I'm going to post this one as well on, yes, on Instagram. So I will turn this into a post. I've been doing that. I don't know how many more of these I'll be doing, but uh, if you have questions, see, if I, if I know what you guys want to hear, I might get on here more because right now, if something's just on my mind and I feel like I could share it with you, I've been doing that. I appreciate you, Rush, and I think you know that. I hope you know that. I, I appreciate you coming on here and, and uh, interacting. Because dog training is a lonely career. It's a lonely occupation like art. I was an artist too. And they're both very lonely because it's a solo thing usually unless you have a team. But even if you have a team, I mean so much work is required to run a board and train. You don't get much time for your social life anymore. So you start to appreciate little moments like this. And uh, who's lovely lady? Do I know? Do I know you lovely lady? Personally, that is because some of these people I do, and I may know, but I don't know their names. I know Mike's on here. I know Phyllis is on here. Um, Russ, and who else did I see? Who's very good dog training, too? You guys can share your names with me if you want, but you don't have to. Awesome. All right, guys. Julie's back. I try to sneak this in while she's dropping Jesse off at home. We got a busy day. We start at 9, so it's 8.30. So technically, I'm not rush to get off from here but i should probably get some breakfast you want to bring us dinner phyllis i am not not gonna deny that i would love that oh awesome okay cool sorry guys i'm just i didn't mean to pry some of the i just want to make sure I, if i did know you i was treating you I was, I was treating you with some respect because a lot of these, some of these people I've trained their dogs and I like to be able to have that knowledge. Okay, so let me know if there's anything else you guys really need to dig into as far as topics. It doesn't even have to be a question. It could just be, Josh, talk about this shit. And maybe if, if it feels like something I want to talk about, we will, okay? And the way you do that is you, you, you DM, just DM the page with a, with a question for the lives and we'll do that, okay? All right, guys, I appreciate you. Thank you for paying attention. Have fun with your dogs today. I know I'm about to go have fun. All this serious talk, right? But then as soon as I get this, boom, everything's straight. Now it's time to go have fun and go play. All right, Let's talk to you guys shortly.